I want to talk today about using strategic industry research to teach uh, sustainability and uh, the uh, SDGs through regional engagement. Uh, I'm a second year faculty member at the State University of New York at New Paltz, which is about midway between Albany and New York City in the Hudson Valley, what's called the Mid-Hudson region. Um, and we're actually in a, in a pretty lucky position because uh, both uh, sustainability and more, uh, uh, more importantly, the SDGs themselves and regional engagement are part of the strategic plan and the strategic planning process uh, for our college. Uh, so when I joined the faculty last year, as an assistant professor of communication, um, I began uh, developing applied projects and service learning projects that can be really uh, scaled up from everything from our introductory strategic communication courses to our se senior seminar. Um, and we've even had discussions in the last year or so um, about adapting some of this to our proposed uh, master's program in communication, uh, in particular because we've been talking about either uh, uh, the constant, uh, basically making the MA program uh, fully focused on uh, nonprofit organizations, or at least having a strong concentration within the master's program uh, that would focus on nonprofits and, and NGOs. Uh, so I'm going to take you a little bit th uh, through uh, some of the projects um, that I've developed over the last year. Uh, the one I was really hoping to be able to present uh, to everyone uh, at the end of last March uh, was sort of blown up uh, by by COVID, uh, but we had done a we had done a good amount of work on that uh, uh, prior to um, us all sort of dispersing to the, sort of the far reaches of the planet. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that project and what that project uh, was supposed to look like. One of the things, Okay. One of the uh, one of the uh, uh, focuses I have uh, within the strategic and organizational communication uh, classes that I teach is acquainting students uh, with uh, stakeholder frameworks and and more importantly uh, stakeholder relationships or connections across the different uh, the different sectors right industry sectors uh, nonprofit fields and so forth so typically I acquaint students with uh, the model of sort of the private sector, the plural public sector, and the plural sector uh, using Mintzberg's uh, framework. Uh, um, uh, is it time for the plural sector from 2015? The private sector being the for-profit firms that, that we are all acquainted with, can, which can range from startups to multinational businesses. The public sector, right? Anything that is essentially funded through public debt or, uh, or taxpayer revenues, uh, local, state, federal agencies, elected officials, appointed officials. Um, and then onto the plural sector themselves, where we have our nonprofits, our non-governmental organizations. Um, and what really meant uh, expanded uh, pretty significantly over the last several years in his discussion about the importance of the plural sector is it's not just the third sector, right? Not just these nonprofits and these non-governmental organizations, um, but the, it also includes a wide range of other organizations. Organizations, right? So social enterprises, uh, social entrepreneurial efforts fit into this, professional associations, right, are different academic professional associations, industry professional associations, such as the Consumer Electronics Association, um, labor unions, this is where we would sort of fit labor unions in because they don't necessarily, you know, fit within that third sector, public sector, private sector model, uh, and cooperatives, everything from member cooperatives to employee owned uh, to employer cooperatives, uh, and then of course, foundations um, and philanthropic uh, funding agencies. Uh, that's sort of what uh, you know we think of um, when we think of the plural sector in a much much, uh, much broader framework. Uh, so this is actually a really important framework that I introduce in all of the classes that I, I teach to the students to start getting to, to think about communication not just as something that happens between people or in small groups, but communication is actually something that can happen between organizations, right? When we think about collaboration, uh, when we think about when we think about problem solving, decision making, building strategic alliances, um, a lot of this actually happens uh, within a broader web of organizations that work together to uh, solve particular problems or to achieve certain goals. Um, so this is sort of the starting framework for a lot of what we do here. Uh, the next thing, which I won't go Excuse too me, into Jack, detail. I'm I'm so sorry I'm, to interrupt you. May I suggest that you put your PowerPoint in slideshow mode? Uh, yeah, I thought it was in. Uh, 
no, let me try this over here because I'm see I've got two screens running and I've got one showing me PowerPoint and uh, one slide mode and one not. Let's try that. And that's not letting me do that. Okay. Uh, let me do this. Let me turn that screen. I'm just going to reopen this PowerPoint. I'm sorry, Jack. I didn't think it would be this complicated. Yeah, that's fine. I that's yeah. You know, I was seeing two screens. One was showing me um, uh, slideshow mode, uh, and then I was seeing another one not. And it doesn't seem like the one that had slideshow mode. So let me uh, go back and uh, share the. Share the screen. Sorry, that's the other thing. We've got every conceivable uh, conferencing tool known to man running here. We've got our WebEx, our Zoom, our Blackboard Collaborates, our Google Beats, as I'm sure everybody's um, uh, been dealing with these last six months or so. Um, all right, so WebEx is down, Collaborates down. Bingo. That's good. Thank you, Jack. All right, you're you're welcome. No problem. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now I'm uh, trying to see. Now I I can't see my screen. <laughs> Let's try this. All right. How is that? Are we seeing? We can see it. Hopefully. Perfect. Can. I'm good. I'm all good. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay. So I will, I will just mention this re really quickly before we go on. So one, one of the key things that we focus on in strategic, in strategic and organizational communication is differentiating between the different types of communication that can operate at different levels. So there are communication processes. The simplest way to think about a communication um, processes is really right those series of steps or actions through which we organize, uh, set goals, do something, right? Uh, for, you know, the example I always use with the students is you have your college, right? There's admission decisions, graduation, you know, um, graduation requirements. Uh, then you have your major, which you again, you engage in a series of interactions to complete those requirements. You have a particular course um, and then a particular class or section that, that may have some variation on, on the course. So the idea behind, um, and how did Okay, so the so the idea be so the idea behind um, this idea of processes, practices, and and uh, tools is that we go from the broader level: how do we gather, organize, talk to one another, um, to particular practices, right? So these can be as simple as hallway conversations, text chats, strategic plans, course assignments, grades, grading, right? Basically, tangible practices that we engage in to communicate about something, and then finally, communication tools, which are Right, we're actually using a tool right now, 
Zoom. I just closed multiple um, uh, web conferencing applications right down from my uh, down from my laptop. Um, and then, of course, we could think about things that are not necessarily digital uh, surveys, focus groups, uh, white papers, reports, memos, and, and all those you know all those fun things that we that we engage in. Um, a lot of this actually stems from this model of um, communicating sustainability or sustainability communication that I've been working on for a couple of years now. Uh, really start my work really is rooted in uh, understanding how communities recover from crisis and disaster, particularly long term recovery after disaster. Um, so I start by looking at sort of the underlying civic networks in a in a community. We go to stakeholder relationships, um, and then of course the particular types of organizations that are engaged in these networks and these relationships. How do they build cross sector partnerships? The particular communication activities that these organizations engage in, and then of course how how can we improve um, or create new forms of uh, of engagement among these different partners? Um, so this is sort of what I try to bring uh, to the students in a much simpler way using particular examples that are rooted in the, you know, in the region around uh, uh, SUNY New Paltz, right, the sort of the Mid-Hudson Valley. Uh, SUNY New Paltz actually, as, as many colleges and universities are, is actually an economic engine for the regions and it provides a, uh, provides a variety of different functions. So um, we go from here to sort of how do we use community engagement and how do we use applied problems to actually um, teach the students about the sustainable development goals and using strategic industry research. So what I'm going to do here is take us through um, sort of the overall um, the problem or the two problems um, that uh, we've developed or I've developed over the last year. Um, and then, of course, I'll just take you through sort of the highlights of how I try to teach um, uh, organizational uh, and industry analysis or strategic industry research to non-business majors uh, enrolled in a, in a communication program. Uh, so, of course, I always introduce the students to the sustainable development goals. We do this in many, uh, many different ways. Uh, sometimes we'll put the, you know, we'll put the website up and we'll open up uh, the different, the different goals and show them different uh, aspects of the, uh, of the definitions, the types of organizations. Uh, again, centering this, uh, centering the course or, or a particular module or uh, component um, of the course around these goals. Um, so the first project we I looked at last year uh, in the fall of 2020 was we did a semester long group assignment. Uh, this was an introductory course. Um, typically students uh, at the uh, sophomores and juniors, uh, we actually our introductory courses in our concentration start at the at the 300 level as, as opposed to, to a 101 course. There's some prerequisites they go to before they get to their, the heart of their concentrations. Um, and with this, so we looked at this particular farm. This is a nonprofit farm uh, located about five miles or so down the road from uh, from our campus. Uh, there's a number of different partnerships um, in, uh, between the farm and the campus. Uh, everything you know, from our environmental sciences, geology, you know, biology departments, uh, to our business school, to our communication department. Um, and this goal was really again trying to teach the students how do you go from a thirty thousand foot level down to a 50,000 foot level. Um uh, I'm sorry, 50,000 foot level down to a 5,000 foot level uh, in terms of understanding the broader industry ecosystem, in, in this case, the Hudson Valley food systems, and then the broader uh, New York State sort of agriculture and food market or the broader sorts of Northeastern regional food systems, right? How does this tiny little farm fit in this larger, um, in this larger uh, framework? Um, and what are the particular um, uh, community relationships that they're engaged in? What is the impact that they, that that they have on that they have on the community. Um, they've got six acres in vegetable production. Uh, the entire property is under a conservation easement. Um, a nonprofit uh, was formed to buy it from some owners about 20 about 20 years ago. And there's a number of wetlands and, and woodlands and, and forested areas. Uh, they've also there they also experiment with uh, different cover crops, everything you would think about with a CSA or a nonprofit farm. Um, and they're particularly trying to you know use different methods that have been used on the land um, since the 17th century. Most of the land has been, um, most of the land in this region has been, um, has been, um, 
most of the land in this region has actually been um, uh, under cultivation for uh, 350, 400 years or so. Um, and like a lot of the Northeast, uh, the region is under significant development pressures. Um, and particularly with the onset of COVID, uh, there's a number of, uh, a lot of development going on. Uh, purchase prices have, have skyrocketed. We have a lot of people moving up from, uh, from really uh, New York City, from the five boroughs, and, and even from some of the close-in suburbs, um, looking for, you know, more, more space and, and supposedly healthier and safer places. Um, so we're able to use this particular project to sort of acquaint students with a range of, of um, range of issues. We're also able to um, take students, whether they're interested in, for instance, if they are interested in, in, in a particular business career, uh, we can actually um, talk about distribution and supply chains um, and sort of how for the sort of the mix of for-profit and nonprofit farms uh, work together um, within this region to sort of promote both agriculture and also protect the community and, and the lands, right? So we get into a number of different SDG goals. But what I want to talk about more specifically is this project I started to develop in the in the spring uh, in partnership with the owner of Quercus Cooperage, uh, which is in High Falls, New York, part of the Mid-Hudson region, part of Ulster County. Uh, they're right, again, right down the road from, uh, from uh, our campus in New Paltz. Uh, Quercus is actually a craft barrel maker. Um, they make barrels. Uh, they make barrels for bourbon. They make barrels for whiskey. Uh, they, uh, they do some wine barrels and some brandy barrels as well, but primarily they're selling into the whiskey and, and the bourbon markets. Um, this uh, image on the left is a whiskey barrel that's uh, in the final stages. It's, be, it's being charred for use in uh, uh, for use in uh, uh, for, uh, storing bourbon. Um, and they've also developed this, uh, another business as well in terms of making different sake vessels. Um, and in fact, they have a, uh, they, that business is probably the more lucrative of the two businesses. Uh, they have an export market into Japan, um, as well as selling into um, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, fine dining, high-end dining um, throughout the Northeastern cor Corridor and nationwide. Uh, so through our different regional engagement initiatives. Um, I had met the owner uh, of uh, Quercus uh, last year, sort of in the late fall, and we talked about doing some projects that would spe work, look specifically at his business um, because the whiskey barrel industry, right, we just think of pe people make whiskey and people throw some wood together, put some water in it. It's actually a pretty skilled uh, a pretty skilled job. Uh, and in fact, in, in Scotland, um, the, being a barrel maker or a cooper, uh, particularly in the more remote regions of the country, uh, is a, is a pretty good lucrative kind uh, kind of job, and um, uh, it's a highly specialized industry. And we're lucky in the Hudson Valley to actually have a specialized industry like this right next door to us. So one of the things we start to talk to the students about is what what does the American craft barrel industry have to do with sustainability? What does it have to do with conservation? And and we take them through the specific goals, right? Whereas actually um, SDG 8, this decent work and economic growth, um, industry innovation and infrastructure, uh, conservation related issues, right? So for instance, the wood that they, that, uh, uh, that they use in this barrel may, uh, with this particular barrel maker comes from a particular part of the Catskill Mountains, not the Adirondacks, you know, not the Northwoods uh, in Vermont or, or the White Mountains in New Hampshire, but it uses a very particular type of wood in the Catskills, which essentially is local to the region. So there's a number of, I mentioned with the farming project, there's a number of development pressures in the region, uh, conserving not only the woodlands, but also the, you know, the, the ecosystem around the woodlands is actually important to sort of maintain maintaining and building a business like this. Um, and then of course we get into partnerships for the goals. Uh, we, uh, this becomes a really interesting way of talking to students how nonprofit and for-profit businesses can connect, uh, how, they, how uh, a, a nonprofit business relationship uh, can foster other relationships. So for instance, if you're uh, familiar with the uh, Hudson Clearwater uh, Sloop, um, there's a lot of environmental water, uh, uh, clean water initiatives um, is, located or anchored in the Mid-Hudson region. Uh, they have a big, like hundreds, uh, 100 gallon or 100 gallon plus barrel that sits on, water barrel that sits on their deck. Uh, they asked Quercus to, to recoup their barrel. Um, and that, um, that became a really, you know, a good thing, right? So not only did the, 
did uh, Clearwater get their barrel recouped, um, but this became a really good opportunity for Quercus to sort of point out their skills, what they can do, and to put them in connection with other local organizations, other nonprofit organizations as well. So again, uh, while this is a for-profit business and they're selling into a, a few different markets, um, they're also working closely with nonprofits. So for instance, uh, up the river in Kingston, New York, there's a couple of uh, craft boat making businesses, right? Or, or craft organizations that focus on uh, wooden boats and, and rebuilding and retooling wooden boats um, that actually provide um, training in different types of woodworking skills um, and uh, uh, different machinery uh, to at-risk youth. Right. So again, we're talking about, you know, partnerships for the common good, partnerships for the goals. By focusing particularly on a, on a particular company within our region, um, I can start to demonstrate how they make these different connections um, that support um, uh, our communities, uh, our kids, uh, uh, at-risk youth, uh, provide job training. So we start with that sort of high level. Um, from there, we sort of talk specifically about what we want to do with the project, right? So we want to understand what the American craft barrel industry is, uh, what Quercus Cooperage is, go through a uh, earned media campaign, uh, which is uh, not paid, right? Uh, paid media is advertising and marketing. I'll, I'll touch on that in, in a second. Uh, but we focus in our classes, particularly on earned media campaigns. Uh, very simple goals uh, for this project. It was to be increased awareness of the Cooperage and Mid-Hudson industry or Mid-Hudson craft industry more broadly. Um, and to communicate sustainability as a competitive advantage, right? Uh, so um, the Quercus Cooperage, by the uh, very nature of its business, uh, is engaged in a number of, um, uh, it connects with a number of the goals and is engaged in a number of sustainability efforts, everything from uh, conservation to job training to uh, helping out nonprofits in, in different ways with their with their skills. Uh, then we start to focus on targeted stakeholder engagement, uh, again, particularly in the Mid-Hudson region uh, and Ulster County, which is where New Paltz is located. Again, our focus really tends to be sort of from the northern tip of Westchester County, just north of uh, New York City up until the suburbs of Albany or a little bit south of the suburbs of Albany. So that sort of, is sort of the footprint through which um, we, uh, we sort of in, engage at a regional level uh, through, our, through our college or through our different efforts. Um, and of course, we want to build and communicate cross-sector partnerships, regional, nationally, and globally. And we can try to show, uh, show students how that's done, or even not even show them how it's done, but help them work through a project um, in which they can start to envision um, how you go about establishing and crafting different partnerships. Uh, this, uh, the, this is really sort of our earned media 101 or my earned media 101, which is the classic five W's, right? Who, what, where, why, and when, uh, who's the project for, or who's the organization, what are we trying to do, uh, where are we trying to do it, right? In this case, uh, Mid-Hudson region of New York. Why are we trying to do it, right? We sort of promote SDGs, uh, communicate sustainability, and promote particular businesses or particular craft businesses within the region. And when are we going to do it? And that when is usually um, bounded by a, by a semester. Uh, just briefly for, for those uh, who are not familiar with the distinctions between earned owned and paid media, uh, earned media is uh, Basically, it's what we think of when we think about public relations. You're not paying for media. It's a very low cost. Um, it involves getting your message, your ideas, your product, your service um, out there through journalists, bloggers, influencers, um, some sort of gatekeepers, or working with the gatekeepers or through owned media uh, to um, uh, to really have the community uh, or a key set of stakeholders become aware of sort of who your organization is or, or what the idea is or, or what the product or service is that you're um, that you're happy about that you're concerned about that you're um, that you're trying to um, uh, make people aware of gain attention about owned media on the other hand uh, is uh, uh, a really important channel for earned media and that is typically when we think of Facebook, Twitter, right, our digital and social media properties, um, that is owned media uh, and then paid media advertising and marketing. In our, and then the strategic communication courses I teach, we focus primarily on the first two uh, components of this, the earned and, and the owned media. Uh, the, we also, uh, it's important to understand the different types of communication channels um, and that sort of face-to-face, -face, which includes word of mouth, is, is the most significant 
significant communication channel and in fact the richest communication channel that there is um, and then from those sorts of face-to-face -face, you know one-to-one -one small group interactions we scale up to large groups right uh, round tables public testimony right so if we're dealing with conservation initiatives if we're de dealing with development pressures um, if we're dealing with uh, creating policies or regulations that promote a particular type of industry or connections between industry and community organizations oftentimes that will uh, um, involve some sort of uh, public encounter public interaction. And then, of course, we have what we typically think of as our communication channels, right? Our radio broadcast uh, print or what used to be print publications, which are oftentimes very mostly digital at this point, uh, cable and broadcast TV, and then social media, which is a great channel for earned, owned, and paid media. And in fact, uh, this is where students gravitate to all the time is social media. Uh, so sometimes we just kind of let it run uh, with the social media as opposed to sort of fleshing out other channels. Um, as I mentioned, also, this is a very module, uh, modular and scalable um, uh, course design. Uh, so I'm actually able to take it from an introductory to a, to a senior seminar level. So for the introductory class, you can let the students maybe play around a little bit more with social media. But in a, in a senior class or a senior seminar at that point, we really want students to think about using a much broader array, array of communication channels in the uh, strategies that they're designing. Um, one of the things, we had a little glitch in the, early, uh, um, in the beginning. So uh, we'll come back to this at the end. But if you want to write down or write down in the chat uh, two to three examples of effective earned or owned media that quickly come to mind. Um, so we can, again, we can oftentimes think about um, uh, things that we see that catch our eye, that catch our attention. Um, this is actually uh, obviously Baby Yoda. Uh, on the left hand is the official avatar of the, uh, the, uh, New, uh, at New, Jer the New Jersey um, Twitter account, at NJGov. Um, and if you're not on the at NJGov train, um, you probably should be. It's, it's an incredible example of earned, uh, of earned media. Um, it's just, it's done really, really well. Uh, and again, if you'll see in the avatar on the left, not only is, is Baby Yoda holding this, you know, a silhouette of New Jersey, uh, Baby Yoda is also masked. And on the right, you see them holding Taylor Pork Roll, right, uh, Pork Roll, which, right, is an industry based in Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, the state's sort of known for it. There's a divide in the state between what you call it, whether you call it Pork Roll or whether you call it something else. Um, and uh, the, the earned media account plays into that. So what we also see is, uh, the state using earned media not only to promote the state and what you typically think a, a state government might be talking about or promoting, but also using their channels to promote businesses within within the state or within the region. So this is one of the things we try to emphasize with the students as well is uh, creative use of owned media and earned media, particularly when we're talking about something that could be complex um, like sustainability or the SDGs or things that students may not think about um, when they think about strategic communication or when they think about marketing or advertising. Um, so we organize, I have the students, um, basically we do some group exercises uh, to try to get the students to categorize things in a particular way. So for instance, here we have uh, we, the first sort of high level categorization of in, is industry and organizations. In this particular case, it's the, American, it's the American craft barrel industry and the particular organization that we're looking at is Quercus Cooperage, right? again, relating to SDG 17. Um, and then um, we start talking more specifically about um, environment, right, conservation of, of land and water um, related to where the organization gets its, its raw materials, its wood from, uh, jobs and careers. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's a very skilled job. It involves math. It, it involves, uh, uh, cra uh, involves craftsmanship. Um, it's, uh, it's much more involved than, than most folks would think. Um, and then, of course, what, are, what the regional impact might be on uh, developing uh, uh, workers um, with these particular skills. Um, and the skills are transferable to some degree. So for instance, the, the founder, the owner of Quercus Cooperage uh, trained as a cabinet maker in Philadelphia where he grew up um, and then spent the first part of his career in Brooklyn, New York, um, basically making high-end cabinets for uh, residences and businesses and, and 
do a really uh, the whole gamut of cabinet making um, before sort of uh, starting to play around with uh, water barrels, which later became his whiskey barrel business, and then creating this business up in the up in the Hudson Valley. Um, so again, there's this op opportunity to, to work across the different SDGs. Uh, and then of course, education and training, the apprenticeships and the transferable skills. Um, and again, there's opportunity to engage with different community organizations that might be addressing um, high youth unemployment rates, uh, at-risk youth, um, uh, youth that aren't going to go to college. Uh, there's a number of different uh, possibilities. Uh, and again, this allows us some flexibility for students to kind of focus on um, different parts of their interest as well. And uh, again, a lot of it depends on how de in depth we're going with that particular, uh, with that particular class or that project. Um, and then start to lay out um, a, a little bit more of a landscape right around the craft barrel industry, uh, SDG 8, SDG 9, SDG 15, SDG 17. Um, again, talking to students specifically that sustainability, social impact, social innovation, um, is part of business, right? It's part. It's part of business. It's part of business life, um, and to, to really get them to think about um, these sort of. Uh, more symbiotic relationships between communities, um, businesses, and nonprofits or the plural sector. Um, that's something we've, I've found, I've taught at a couple of universities, um, and that's something I find uh, whether we're teaching at, at, a, at a large, you know, public land grant university or a regional uh, comprehensive uh, student, and, and even at, at, uh, at a private university, you know, at a, at a uh, a select a private university. Uh, students sometimes have trouble grasping the idea that um, uh, there's these sort of connections between uh, business uh, communities and nonprofit or the plural sectors. So the SDGs provide a really, uh, a really interesting and unique way to start getting students to think about these broader sets of relationships. Um, and then by extension, it gets them to start to think about a broader set of careers or career opportunities. Uh, we're at 302. Um, the teams that were set up uh, last spring before we um, unfortunately ended due to COVID, and we actually had a really interesting spring. Be, uh, be in mid-February, there was a major gas leak into the main uh, water pipe that uh, feeds both our, our college and the town. So we were shut down for a week. Um, everybody had to go home from campus. Uh, we came back after they fixed the water main break, and it, 10 or 11 days later, uh, we are starting to plan to shut down for COVID. Uh, so this was a really interesting, we had, we had a really great sort of first third of the semester, if that, uh, really getting this set up and, and starting to engage with, with the community and then we had to shut it down. Um, but these are the, uh, again, we, the teams, again, looking, one team would be looking at that sort of 30,000, 50,000 foot level, the American craft barrel industry, which is primarily focused in the Hudson Valley and in the Chicagoland region. Uh, so it's a small industry and has has small, uh, small footprint. Um, and looking particularly within uh, Hudson Valley, again, those SDG 17 relationships, um, and then taking it down even smaller, to um, the particular county. Um, and the reason we brought, I brought it down to the count, county level was to take advantage of uh, some of these organizations. Uh, in the northern uh, reaches, there's some, there's some uh, areas of, which has a lot, rural areas with a lot of inequality, um, but we also have Kingston, which is an urbanized environment. Um, and they also have uh, significant issues relating to uh, different uh, different inequalities. Uh, so by taking this down to a county level, uh, we're able to connect with uh, some more specific community organizations. Um, and then of course, really the two things we're looking at is understanding the company itself, the company itself and the craft barrel industry. Uh, communicating, um, doing a communication audit and assessment, and I'll, I'll take us through a couple slides for that. Um, and that's sort of what we're doing with this particular project. And I'm hoping uh, to, to re 
uh, reinitiate this project in some way, either figure out a way to do it virtually. Um, there's something tangible when you're doing face-to-face, -face. Uh, somebody burning a barrel uh, in front of a bunch of students live uh, is a lot different than, than doing it virtually or, or showing pictures. Uh, and that's the other uh, great uh, advantage of using sort of the SDGs to teach strategic industry research, particularly to non-business majors, uh, is that we can actually, um, we can grab their attention, right, with a farm or a burning barrel or a boat or, or something, um, and students can start to see tangible relationships between organizations, relationships, and then like concrete sorts of physical, uh, physical objects. Um, the other question, which maybe we can come back to, if, if you want to think about some social in, uh, impact organizations or efforts in your own city or region, um, like I said, we're we're lucky because our strategic planning process focuses around regional engagement and sustainability. Uh, so building that into course design um, is really supported in, in different ways. Uh, but this is transportable. So for instance, there's are two examples. On the left-hand side, we have the Garden State Urban Farm Farmers, uh, which is basically has built sort of uh, micro greenhouses, does micro green, uh, sells micro greens um, on essentially abandoned city spaces in the oranges. Um, and then the right is Aero Farms, which is located in Newark, the, the host of our conference, um, which is one of the largest vertical far farm uh, manufacturers in the world. And in fact, they recently located their headquarters there. So we can find examples um, that we can bring into our court, uh, into our courses um, in different, uh, in different regions, right? And in our, in our own communities. Uh, so that's the other reason I like this is that it's a very um, uh, adaptable and uh, the modular approach to try and understand strategic industry research and the SDGs. So take a few minutes to go through what I mean by strategic industry research skills or how I approach it uh, with strategic and organizational communication majors uh, who may or may not have taken electives um, in our in our business school. Um, so I center communication analysis since this is a communication uh, major communication degree. Uh, uh, again, talking about the particular content, what is being said, what do those messages look like, the channels, how is content distributed, um, and then are these content channels effective or how they can be how they can be improved. Um, at the graduate level, we can start to bring in communication design, uh, which, it, which is simply a process of, of understanding a particular communication process or practice or tool, um, and then intervening in a particular way uh, to improve its effect effectiveness or perhaps creating a, uh, a new uh, alt alternative to the way in which something's been done. Um, so that's that's sort of fun to do at the, at the graduate level. Um, we start with uh, external industry analysis, um, particularly for the introductory courses. This is a great opportunity uh, to bring the students uh, uh, to the library or have the librarians uh, come to our class and really acquaint students with the variety of different um, uh, so, uh, resources that we have. Uh, as part of the SUNY system, um, we have access to a lot of resources um, that may not necessarily um, be physically or even um, sort of that first, uh, physically located in our library or available through sort of the first search. Um, so our librarians can really teach, show them how that they can uh, navigate this large set of resources we, we have access to. Um, and then if we go to organizational analysis, we take it down. Oftentimes we'll use uh, organization websites. Uh, I oftentimes have students identify the, the mission statement, um, the story of the company to get a sense of, of, of the sort of the history and the context and, and the current uh, operations uh, of the um, of the organization, the communication analysis, of course, and we go to findings and recommendations, and then presentations and reports. There's usually a, both a visual and a written um, uh, deliverable at the end of these projects. Uh, sources for strategic research. Again, I sort of start them with our library resources and sources, making them know, again, the first stop is the library. Uh, we have some resources available both in the community library um, within sort of the village and town of New Paltz, as well as within the larger um, Libraries located up in up in Kingston, uh, which is the count, which is the county seat. Uh, so again, telling students like don't just sit at your desk you know doing the computer uh send emails uh make phone calls um get up from the desk walk off campus there's a lot of resources um that you um 
that are accessible to you. So again, trying to teach them um, that research is uh, is an interactive process um, as well as an analytical process, and, and not everything is found through sort of a Google search or Wikipedia. Um, and then I take them through the other types of sources that we have: academic reports and studies, uh, independent research centers, and think tanks. Right. So in this uh, this table is actually from the the Phillies Bridge, the Farm Project. So I uh, show them sort of our the food tank or the Institute for Agriculture and Food Policy up in Minneapolis uh, as places that might have white papers or other information available, um, the different types of academic centers. So again, for this project, for every project, um, I show them our Benjamin Center, which is a, a center focused particularly on regional engagement, and they have a number of reports and studies um, that they've done on different topics over the years. And then I'll show the students another university resource. So for the food systems project, um, I showed them the UC Davis um, Agricultural Sustainability Institute. Um, again, it's a you know an area of expertise um, that has some resources available. Government sources. And then, of course, we get to industry and consulting reports. Uh, most of the industry and consulting reports, as I tell the students, are usually behind paywalls. Uh, but sometimes there is a report or a small white paper that's that's available that's come out of one of their studies, or there may be press releases. Um, so it's usually worth checking out different um, either commu uh, 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 communication and media. Uh, or PR agencies, as well as some of the more traditional um, consulting firms like a BCG or a McKinsey. Uh, you never know what you can find. And, and that's sort of what uh, we try to teach the students um, to think about. Um, because we want our communication students to be able to understand organizations, industries, uh, cross-sector relationships, right? Because com communication doesn't operate in a vacuum. It operates in, in within a context. Um, and oftentimes, uh, well, students will come with the conception that I'm great at social media and that's what it's all about. Uh, but in order to really do social media well, right, to, to control an owned media channel in a way that's super effective, having an understanding of that broader sort of organizational and industry context is really important. Um, these are sort of the uh, key research questions I ask students to ask. Uh, the goal of the organization, mission or purpose, culture and values, who do they serve? Who do they think they serve? Again, we can get issues into issues of inequalities, representation, and voice through these questions. Um, and then, of course, capacity and scale questions. How large is an organization in terms of people, clients, dollars? Um, uh, and then um, I always ask students to differentiate between strategy and planning. And, and in fact, when I did consulting, I would often make this differentiation um, uh, for my clients or ask them to make that differentiation. Um, what I, I really, the way I really say is, right, planning, it's, it's about budgets, it's about measurement, it's about what are we going to do? Did we accomplish it? And um, was it successful or not, right? So it's very sort of specific around uh, uh, goals, uh, measurement, um, as well as um, capacity. Do we have the people? Do we have the dollars? Do we have the material resources we need to accomplish what we need? Um, strategy, I use a broader definition. I think I use in strategic and organizational communication, again, teach it as an interactive process or a process of interaction, right? Surprise, surprise, communication professor talking about strategy, but we'll talk about it from a communicative perspective. Um, but again, asking um, students to think about what are the values and the identity of the organization? Who are the key partners? Who should you be partnering with? Because we're And that's something that the students can really do and do well um, with these projects is that they can start to identify a broader set of organizations um, um, that our focal organization um, might want to connect with or, or should connect with um, in certain ways. So with the Food Systems Project, uh, we were able to sort of uh, get a couple of folks associated with the farm to start thinking, you know, about doing some more work with the Cooperative Extension and to get the Cooperative Extension uh, to start thinking more specifically around about uh, nonprofit farms and the role of nonprofit farms within the broader sort of uh, food systems mix within uh, within this region. Um, funding and then of course staffing and volunteers. I always ask, particularly when we're dealing with nonprofit and plural sector organizations, a uh, key question for these organizations to ask is, do our staff and our volunteers look like the communities we serve or operate in, 
right? Uh, we see that a lot in human services and social services, as well as more broadly in nonprofits, um, that perhaps the organization uh, is not hiring from or is not reflective of the community or the region in, in some way for any any number of reasons. Uh, again, good questions, particularly again for public university, uh, a public university such as a SUNY system, similar to the Rutgers system where we have very, you know, very diverse student populations. Um, these are the types of questions that students can, once they get a hold of, um, they really they really start to, to dig in and, and start to ask some interesting questions and, and have some interesting insights. Um, and then finally, uh, assessing the communication strategy and targets. Um, I really have them look at the broader communication channels, um, the specific promotional strategies. I oftentimes have them do a press release assessment. Um, and I've been wrestling with the whole press release concept for a few years now. Um, it, it's becoming less and less relevant. However, it's it's a great sort of like unit of information, even if nobody's reading it. It's something that's easily can move across a number of digital properties. It's a good teaching tool in certain ways. Um, it provides basic information. Um, and then of course, measurement and evaluation. Um, Again, sort of uh, just sort of summarizing, um, we focus on key external stakeholders, the communication strategies and channels, including how that's operating within a broader industry and organizational um, and interorganizational context. Um, and of course, the message and the story um, narratives, as well as uh, particular uh, messages and, and promotions. Um, and then um, that's it. So um, that's sort of how we sort of teaching students to think about sustainability and to think about how they can communicate sustainability. Um, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility, CSR jobs, particularly for students in interested in for-profit companies, um, that's a, that is a growing portion of the um, of the job market, uh, more companies are implementing uh, CSR and social impact initiatives. Uh, so I feel that uh, by combining sort of the SDGs with uh, strategic industry research, uh, we develop a pretty good tool set um, for students uh, to, to walk out uh, or walk off of our, our college campus with. Um, so with that, um, I'll take I'll take questions, but we'll also be interested in hearing what people are thinking about um, with, you know, great examples of earned and, and uh, owned media that uh, that they may have seen recently and what types of social impact organizations in your own communities um, uh, and your own uh, and surrounding your own college campuses that you think might be useful to this approach useful for this approach so thanks Jack that was really fascinating and deep dive into a wonderful course that you have. Is that taught only in the communications department or in the business school? I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, it's, it's only taught in the department of communication. So we, we have three concentrations, one of which is strategic communication. Um, those students can choose electives uh, and even foundational courses from across the concentrations. Okay, so I could see it being equally applicable to a number of business courses and marketing, for example. Yeah, I'm getting more and more, I'm getting more and more uh, either uh, business students taking this as an elective or business minors oh, okay. actually taking these courses. Yeah. Is, well, I love the way you integrated uh, so many techniques and tools into the course and the SDGs. Very, very well done. Uh, what comments or questions do we have? I'm looking for uh, people to write some comments. They're uh, stunned by the. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of information, I know. So. <laughs> no, it's great. Really interesting, very in depth. So. Excellent presentation, very interesting. Looking for questions or comments yeah. from the audience. So again, one of the questions, right, is is what can is there like Wendy's is a perfect example, right, um, of a very for-profit 
consumer-oriented business that uses its own media, right? It uses its digital properties in a very unique way, you know, has a very sort of sarcastic kind of voice. And, and in some ways, that's what the at NJGov account sort of built off of, that sort of ironic, sarcastic, direct kind of communication. So I, I'm very interested in hearing, because uh, I, I, my own edification and learning process as well, what, what are people seeing uh, uh, in terms of different social media strategies? Um, uh, because what I've been finding too is that focusing again on social media, at least to start, is is a great way to to start to get students to engage around more uh, more complex topics. We do have two questions now. First one is, what's the most difficult challenge you faced during this? Uh, I guess that would be pre-COVID or post-COVID. Um, <laughs> so I think the most the most challenging I think there's is the is the time uh, is the time management um, and uh, try because ideally we'll try to get students to the particular site um, and obviously that can be a little bit um, difficult with everybody's um, schedule. So I'd say that's uh, that's a challenge um, and I think the other the other challenge is really to get students to um, uh, think more broadly about those intersections um, between uh, uh, business community and nonprofit or plural sector. And these are undergrads, did you say? The, these are undergrad. These are undergraduates. Yeah, I, I've taught a very small portion of it uh, at a uh, to a master's level nonprofit leadership class, uh, but but not because there are so many other things we had to cover. We did not kind of go in depth into this. Yeah. All right, another question. Um, they said really, Jeff Younger said really fantastic. What is the basic framework that overarches all businesses you approach? The the overarching framework, uh, it would be it would be a, a stakeholder thinking or a, or a stakeholder framework, right? So, uh, particularly what I what I'm finding, right? So. In the particular formulation of stakeholder theory, the focus was really around organizational survivability. Um, and Freeman's very specific that, right, it's not it's not this sort of universal kind of meta theory. Um, however, um, when they start, uh, he's done some work and some of the colleagues, uh, Strand, I think is another one. When you start looking at sort of, the, sort of the Scandinavian kinds of, or the Nordic kind of flavors of stakeholder theory, you're looking at a lot more about community embeddedness uh, so based on the work I've done around long-term recovery after disaster, I, and moving this towards the concept of sustainability, uh, I think we can start talking about community survivability, right? So that within a straight stakeholder framework, we can talk not only about organizational survivability, how does the organization right, um, succeed? How does it perform over a long period of time, but also the community as well? Um, because again, I would say the organization's embedded within that community. So uh, I would say sort of the stakeholder framework is, is the primary um, uh, framework in which this probably sits. Okay, here's a comment from Magda Camo. Example, in a close neighborhood, there are lawn signs stating, my neighborhood hates kids and my neighborhood loves kids. So the signs are present on each lawn and list a website. It was intriguing enough for me to look up the site and find the neighborhood is petitioning for sidewalks. Interesting. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, and that's a great example of using like a physical kind of, you know, device as well as sort of a digital, you know, digital device, right? Or digital property as well as a physical um, communication. While we're waiting for another question, I'll throw in a question. In terms of the industry and selecting the industry, it sounds like it's really based on who's in your local regional area as opposed to saying, I'm going to focus on this industry or that industry and then go find someone. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, yes, that's 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 accurate. Uh, that's how I've been developing um, the courses or doing the, the course design um, at uh, at New Paltz. Uh, again, because uh, we're lucky enough, uh, there's there's a lot of really interesting um, uh, community organizations and businesses and industry in in the region. And then, given the fact that our college does make regional engagement and does make sustainability a priority. Um, it's it's great, you know, and it's a lot easier. Obviously, you can imagine um, navigating, say, Ulster County than than New York City, right? Or or even um, uh, northeastern New Jersey. I'm a New Jersey native. I'm actually uh, I my permanent residence is down near Long Branch, right? So which is where I'm communicating from now. Um, so it's a little it, it Ulster County is a little bit easier uh, to define regionally. Um, 
and uh, uh, so it really works for this uh, for this particular student population in this particular college campus. So when the students, the undergrads, are going out, are they like driving together to these different locations, and and you go with uh, them? We don't talk about that. <laughs> There's, uh, there is, there is, there was, but there was a budget uh, that would allow for transportation, like usually cabs and and things like that. Um, there, uh, basically, the students are are driving to are driving to the site um, in in some way. So we're trying to. Uh, there are obviously liability issues as 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 well, um, so that's that's something that and that's actually there's other um, faculty that do applied problems and service learning as well. So that's that's sort of a topic of ongoing conversation is is how do we basically do this well and how do we do it safely, um, particularly you know in an era of declining budgets. School also have an undergrad major or minor in sustainability. Uh, we just launched uh, an environmental studies major, but there's not a specific uh, concentration oh. in sustainability. Okay. One of my colleagues right, is have... actually involved in that. Yep. Okay. Any more questions before we uh, close out this wonderful session? Going once. Excellent presentation. How do you make sure that the student deliverables are of high quality? That's another question from Baron Gunner. Um, usually what I, I do is I try to work with the students much as I would work with like a project team or, or a consulting team. Uh, so oftentimes we'll do some, uh, we'll do some in-class uh, uh, workshopping uh, either together or look at their deliverables. Um, I usually do a scaffolding. I usually have them submit a draft um, and then I make some uh, suggestions and markup and then they'll submit a final uh, project towards the end of the semester. Okay, well, with that, that was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot um, just listening to you and I got a lot of great ideas. So thank you. And I want to encourage everybody to please rate the session by selecting the stars under feedback in the Entity app or by clicking the link that was just put in the by Nirmala. Thank you, Nirmala, in the chat. Thank you so much, Jack. Great job. Great. Thank you.